Care Can, an organization that came out of the amalgamation of what we used to call the Canadian Hospital Association and the Association of Canadian Economic Health Care Organizations. I'll explain a little bit more of that merger. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Mr. Ray Rosette, uh, he's the President and CEO of the Canadian College of Health Leaders, and uh, our VP of, of Learning, and Mr. Dale Sherback. So, um, we're your panel for today, and we're just in case you want to check to see if you're in the right room, this is the Canadian Experience Room, right? How many Canadians are in the room? Just curious. Where are you from? Uh, from uh, Ontario Shores. Ontario Shores. So you'll be able to help us out with some of the exemplars coming out of Ontario. And over here? I'm from uh, British Columbia. Uh, we have with uh, Help Share Services BC. Help the Shared Services BC. Okay, and there was another hand over here. Or is that it? Okay, so we've got uh, three colleagues to help us out if we get uh, stuck uh, from Ontario and British Columbia. Um, so this morning in the half an hour, or an hour and a half, I think we have, maybe a little less now, we wanted to cover off these three objectives. Share with you very briefly some of the policy challenges and opportunities facing uh, Canadian healthcare, system reform at, me at many levels. Discuss some of the innovative leadership initiatives that are occurring nationally, provincially, and locally. Uh, and finally, showcase some of the, the key leadership and governance uh, responses to some of these challenges. And uh, I'm sure that if we were in any number, any one of the other rooms, we'd probably have some similar stories to, to share and some, uh, some similar uh, um, lessons to learn. So um, I'm going to start with um, sort of setting the Canadian context, reminding some of you of, uh, from whence we've come as a healthcare system, how our system's organized, financed, delivered, um, the role of the federal government in. Uh, and increasingly in, in shaping the, the innovation agenda in Canada. Share one province's perspective, because we have 10 provinces and three territories, and it really is not one Canadian perspective, it's actually 14 different healthcare systems. We have one of the most decentralized, if not the most decentralized system of health system financing and administration in the industrialized world. Come back to that. And then we'll, we'll give you some highlights on what we're trying to do to build to take advantage of that diversity. Right? I'm a health economist by training, so we like to think of our system as kind of a natural experiment. The lessons learned from BC informing the lessons learned from Ontario and vice versa across our different jurisdictions. So rather than lament the decentralization, we actually try to celebrate it and leverage it up. You know who we are. So putting Canada in, the, in, the, in a global context. So. Uh, in five minutes or less, how would you describe Canada's health and healthcare system? Well, I've already let you know that it's decentralized. Why is it decentralized? It's decentralized because, according to our constitution, health and healthcare is principally a provincial responsibility. Right? So it's the provinces and the territories in Canada that actually deliver, plan, uh, and, uh, and manage and administer Canada's health and healthcare systems. Uh, we've had a universal, and still have, a universal prepaid health insurance program, which provides for over 90% of coverage of hospitals, 98 covers 98% of, of physician earnings, and provides for certain other uh, hospital hospital-related services, uh, uh, such as in uh, uh, in hospital pharmaceuticals, but does not provide for out-of-hospital pharmaceuticals. Um, the uh, it's, the system is financed. Uh, by and large through uh, tax revenues. Uh, the federal government shares in the costs of provincial health care programs. In the early days, it was on a 50-50 basis. The provinces and the territories decided what they were going to spend in eligible areas of health spending in hospitals and physicians. And the federal government cut a check for 50% of those eligible health care expenditures. That changed in 1977, a major change in the way in which our the federal and the provincial governments work together. It changed to a block funding arrangement, not unlike what I understand to be here in the United States with respect to Medicaid program where the federal government provides block grants uh, to the state level. Um, 1977, we moved to block funding. Uh, fast forward, um, Canadian health and healthcare system, uh, like many systems around the world, had to face uh, some, uh, some challenges around uh, Financing in, in Canada's case, it came in 1995 in response to some uh, recessionary pressures, uh, and the federal government cut back on healthcare spending. And today, 
the federal government again provides for about 23% of total provincial health and health care spending. So the federal government over the years has, has played a role in health and health care by using what we call spending power. The federal government has uh, um, the preponderance of, of taxing power and in return for the provinces meeting five criteria and two conditions the federal government shares in their, in their provincial programs. So that kind of puts Canada in the, hopefully in the, in the internet. We're kind of a, a bit of a hybrid. For those of you from the UK, we, we took the NHS model with a twist. Physicians in Canada, unlike in the UK, are not on sound. 73% of Canadian physicians still are independent contractors and build a plan through a fee-for-service system. That percentage, that percentage of physicians paid through non-fee-for-service methods, capitation, and so forth, that percentage is growing and growing fairly substantially. So it's, it's, it's gone from less than 10% up to, you know, 23%, and that, that's accelerated. As I said, it's the role of the provinces, and increasingly, uh, we're going to share with you the, the Ontario experience, but maybe the way to introduce this is I was here for the American Hospital Association meeting not very long ago, and at the end of two days, the chair of the board for the American <coughs> Hospital Association <coughs> asked me, so, is it a lot like this in Canada? And I said, well, no, not really. He says, what do you mean? I says, I want you to imagine, you've been pretty hard on Mr. Obama over the last two days okay. with Obamacare. I want you to, I understand that Mr. Obama is holding a press conference at the White House tomorrow and he's going to announce that the federal government's had enough and that he's just going to cut one big check to the states and have Medicare, the Medicare gum off his shoe. I'm tired of it. That's essentially what our federal government has done. It cuts a massive check, $34 billion a year to the provinces and says, now for you. The second, and then he said, so how else does Canada stack up against the United States? And he said, well, I want you to imagine, you have 50 states, I want you to imagine that every state in the union, except one, deemed hospitals to no longer legally exist. That's what's happening to Canada. Ontario is the only province in Canada that still has legal entities called hospitals. In your province, British Columbia, you have six regional health authorities, actually seven if you count the the Aboriginal uh, First Nations uh, uh, Regional Health Authority. Uh, Alberta, um, the, the place where all the oil comes from and that Keystone Pipeline that's not going to be built now. Um, that uh, now has one Regional Health Authority with a budget of $13.4 billion and uh, staff of 120,000. So as you go across the country, every province in the country except Ontario, and that's why we've selected Ontario to showcase for you a little bit later this morning. Every uh, province in the country has now got regionalized health care systems. And that's where the managerial responsibility resides for running our health and health care systems now. In terms of governance, uh, I've talked about regionalization. In terms of governance, in Ontario, we still have community health boards, community hospital boards. I sit on one, the Royal Ottawa in Ottawa. Um, but that, again, is the exception. We have, in most provinces politically appointed regional health authority boards, not elected. And healthcare innovation agenda. So what do I want to say here, or what do we want to say here? Um, I guess the place to start, uh, I was recently reminded by a colleague, we had Hillary Clinton in her first incarnation, right, as, as uh, first lady come up to Canada in 1995. And basically asked the question, why is it that Canada spends so little? Back then we were spending about 7.9% of our GDP on health and health care. And we were in the top rungs of international league tables, like the Commonwealth Fund, like the OECD. We now find ourselves in the, in the position where we now rank 10 out of 11 on the Commonwealth Fund statistics. Any guesses to who takes up the 11th spot? <coughs> our friends here in the United States. Uh, in some measure, the United States, as our benchmark, exists to help us look good until we start to look at how we stack up against other industrialized countries. So by virtue of many key health indicators, we've dropped in the space of about 20 years from the top tercile to one of the bottom tercile performing healthcare systems in the world. Now that's pretty depressing, right? 
I'm an economist after all. Dismal science, things are bad, they're really, really bad, they can only get worse. Um, until you start to look at the exemplars that we're going to try and showcase to you today, if we took all of the different best performing parts of our system and put them together, we rank first among that, uh, among uh, Commonwealth health countries. So, good, uh, Commonwealth health countries. So, one of the challenges in Canada is how do you, and we'll spend quite a bit of time talking to the innovation agenda for this reason, how do we leverage up what we know and put it into practice? Or another way to state it, how do we close the no-do gap? We know what we should be doing, but we're not doing it. So how do you scale up and speed up the process of innovation, applying what we already know? So that's going to be kind of the focus of what we get into. Uh, again, uh, just to maybe uh, extend a couple of points. So evolving role of the federal government. Uh, we sit here, how many, how many days is it now to our federal election? October 19th, we'll have a federal election. And in some measure, the federal election is, uh, while health care has only recently gone onto the federal agenda, uh, the political agenda, in some respects, it's a, a bit of a referendum on that role of that federal government. Should it continue to have a hands-off, disentangled role? Or is the federal, should the federal government take a stronger leadership role in areas like Universal Pharmacare. We're the only country in the world with a prepaid medical insurance plan that does not have prepaid out of hospital drugs. Uh, we pay more per capita on drugs than virtually any other country in the world. So that's one political issue that we're, we're looking at in Canada. Seniors care. I mean, again, this isn't a unique to Canada. Uh, uh, we did a survey recently at Healthcare Can asking Canadians, what really worries you? 70% of Canadians said they were worried about falling through the cracks. And when we asked them, um, what does that mean to you? It's the handoffs that we just heard about in the system. They, uh, is there a smooth transition through the continuum of care? Uh, and it's particularly worrisome when it comes to end of life issues, and particularly frail elderly, near frail elderly, and their caregivers. One interviewee put it, and when asked, what do you mean by that, said, I don't know who's going to find my marbles when I lose them. Right? So that's one area that was of concern. Another one is this issue that I just raised. Canadians are worried. 63% of them are worried when they read in the newspapers and hear from the, the politicians that Canada's health care system is falling behind the Nordic countries, and Germany, France, UK, Australia. They're worrying about that. They don't know much about why it is because they don't experience the health care systems of other countries. They just read about it and they worry about that. So, um, what have we been trying to do? And I'll just I'll conclude here in a minute. And then we're going to open it up for questions uh, about any questions that you might have about Canada's health and healthcare system before we go to the next uh, two parts. So, what are we doing about it? The Canadian College of Health Leaders and, Canadian, and Healthcare Can we co host each year the largest leadership conference in health in the country. We just had our, our, our 2015 conference in wonderful Prince Edward Island uh, in June. And uh, our next one, by the way, is in Ottawa, June uh, 5th, 6th. Please put it in your calendars. Um, but we, we held for the first time ever what we have modestly called the Great Canadian Healthcare Debate. And why did we do that? We did that because uh, in what many had written about and, and what certainly in my 40 years in, in the healthcare business found was that healthcare is, kind of goes underground when we call elections. It was seen as, quote unquote, the third rail of Canadian politics. You touch it and you die. One of our premiers famously said, I haven't had a conversation about health care that didn't cost me votes. Right? So what we tried to do was to shine a light on the issues that are of concern to Canadians, like falling through the cracks, like our crumbling infrastructure. We've estimated that we have at least 14 billion and as much as maybe $28 billion in accumulated deferred maintenance in our health and healthcare system. We'd love to be able to have the money to, to move towards that hospital of the future uh, that was just described by Kaiser Permanente. But again, the federal government hasn't been of much help in terms of infrastructure support. We have what's called the Canada um, a Build Fund that provides for capital infrastructure support for bridges, for airports, even for sewers. 
but healthcare need not apply because it's a provincial responsibility. So some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of, um, and that we put on the table, right, right, at our conference in Prince Edward Island, to try and get people talking about it. Even to say that Canada now ranks 10th out of the 11 of Commonwealth countries in terms of overall key performance indicators has taken a lot. It's taken a lot for us to, to get to that point. Um, so uh, just putting that on the table. National Advisory Panel on Healthcare Innovation. So um, just before the election writ was dropped, we received the report of a federal advisory panel chaired by Dr. David Naylor. Uh, and it basically says we need to put our money where our mouth is in terms of investing in innovative practices, scaling up and spreading the exemplaries, uh, exemplary practices across the country. The Healthcare Innovation Working Group. This was a working group formed by the provincial premiers um, and produced a report called uh, Innovation from Innovation to Action. And again, depending on who forms the next government in Canada, that will either have increased legs or not. In the province of Ontario, we have not so recently now, I guess it's about a year ago, that we, uh, we had the tabling of the Ontario uh, Health Innovation Council report. And I want to share with you in the next uh, kind of segment of this, sort of what we've been doing with uh, our colleagues at the Canadian, uh, the Council of Academic Hospitals of Ontario to try and uh, uh, to, uh, to speed up that process of innovation. So I'm going to stop there before we get into Ontario and ask, uh, first off, any comments from our Canadian colleagues? Ontario? We're about to get into it, but did you have any comments uh, at this point? Um, system. Um, I mean, there's been attempts to regionalize it and create uh, local bastions of uh, accountability through local health integration networks, but it's still very much a, a piecemeal, uh, episodic care-based system where you have various players that are taking care of patients at various times, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, there's, there's very little bit in the way of ensuring that there's no transitions and and accountability around preventative medicine and keeping the population healthy and good population health initiatives. I mean, I think there's lots of really innovative, interesting things happening in Ontario, but the political levers aren't there to um, build the kind of health care system we heard that you know, Kaiser is <coughs> So just to that point, one of the things you might want to come back to is what, what constitutes good governance in a health care system? Well, we've kind of come, I think, uh, finally to is a conclusion that you, can't, you have to align authorities and accountabilities in the system. Whether you regionalize or not, the authorities and the accountabilities have to go together. Right? Otherwise, it's a really stressful place. It's not good to be held accountable for something that you have absolutely no authority over. Sally, so, yeah, we call that stress of distress. <laughs> right? um, so maybe we come back to that, and I think uh, you're right, uh, you know, Terry, we have some lessons to learn. And, okay, yeah? I should just add, too, that my perspective is a little bit different, right, because I'm a, um, I'm a psychiatrist, a practicing physician, and my leadership role is in medical informatics, so okay. um, things are particularly not, not good to describe right <laughs> <Ontario. laughs> And our colleagues from BC, you, know, you have one of the more stable systems in Canada, so in a world where we have a tendency to kind of blow up regional authority and then put them back together in some manner, we, BC is kind of unique. You've had five regional health authorities now for the better part of 10 years or so, right? Uh, exactly, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we started prior to 1995, we had over 100 health boards. Wow. And, and uh, after 1995, that 100 health boards became 52 regional health authorities. Right. And then in 2001, that 52 became six health authority of today. Right. And out of the six, there's one provincial in nature and mm -hmm. five are regional in nature. And then recently, they have a First Nation health authority. So I think we came a long way. And uh, we, before, we always learn from our experience. So today, we have six health authorities, but we only have one shared services for all the back-end support services. And that's where my organization is. So you're with uh, the Provincial Health Services uh, Authority, right? We, we have division off. Okay. But I also heard that we're going to be a standalone organization in the foreseeable future. Okay, so even in BC, things are changing. Yeah, BC things are changing. Any questions from uh, any of the 
anybody in the room about Canada's health and health care system? We spend about, by the way, $220 billion a year Canadian on health and health care. That represents 11.7% of our gross domestic product. That's fairly level over the last little while. Uh, about 70% of that comes from the public purse, 30% comes from the private sector. Again, that's been fairly steady over the last 10 to 15 years, hasn't changed much. There's what we call passive privatization in the system going on, so as we make progress in early discharge programs and reducing lengths of stay, uh, Canadians are being discharged in many cases to uninsured environments where more and more uh, Canadians are having to pay out of pocket for physiotherapy, for uh, out of hospital drugs. That's linked to the fact that we've got had a casualization of the workforce in Canada. Yes, we're getting more and more jobs, but in many cases they're not permanent jobs, they're not full-time jobs, and therefore you don't have the supplementary health insurance that's often associated with uh, your employment. So maybe just a few other facts about Canada's health and health care system. If there are no, any comments from Ray or this one? No, the only thing I'm trying I, to keep it interactive. The only thing I would add too is we're also a young country relative to Europe and other parts of uh, the world and, and we struggle with aging in, in terms of, uh, because we're episodic based and we're primarily acute focus, we struggle and often um, uh, patients end up, uh, in, they, they get caught in hospitals where they can't go into another setting and, and the, so we become inefficient on the hospital side because we don't have the capacity that we need for uh, caring in the community. So. We have just uh, we have gaps in our system, primary care and, and uh, I would say home-based uh, settings that are challenging, I think, all across the country. And we have different models of trying to tackle that. But those are probably the biggest gaps that we have in terms of modernizing our health system. Yes, please. I would say one of the other challenges that's facing Canada is we have such a large uh, geographical area to cover and we don't have a lot of people. Even in BC, in the northern area, you know, I think what we heard this morning about the future of the care model, it really applies. Because if we can bring care to their home, and in BC we did some of that in terms of the real renal dialysis for, for peritoneal dialysis kind of treatment, instead of having the patient coming to the home, to the hospital, we deliver the service to their home. So I think that more and more we need to think in those terms to sustain the future of healthcare. So uh, just to that point, yes, we've got the second largest geography on the planet, uh, uh, 36 million people. Uh, largely, by the way, distributed within 100 miles of the U.S. border. Right. Right. Um, and so we pioneered telemedicine, um, tele tele teaching. We heard earlier on. We have a medical school. It's called Northern Ontario Medical School that teaches, uh, not exclusively. We still have be real patients as opposed to virtual patients, but uh, there's been some pioneering technology both in terms of telemedicine and telelearning uh, because of that, uh, that uh, geographic uh, sparsity of the population. Okay. I guess it's kind of like after that, that president of uh, Kaiser Permanente, everything's kind of, everybody's still thinking about that, right? <laughs> like, uh, like, what a vision for the future, right? It's, if you had to rebuild it, you'd start with the technology and then get around the hospitals and not the other way around. And I, that still stuck with me, right? Um, so let's move to Ontario, one of ten provinces. Uh, as I said, we have ten provinces, three territories, each semi-autonomous or autonomous in terms of their health and health care system. Ontario is the only one that... Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Ula Maria Ulva from Finland, and we are with five million quite a vast country. And I always think that we can compare so that's why I enjoyed your presentation. I'd like to know how you compare, the, uh, how you measure the different provinces' results in queuing, specialities, right. more age prevalence, more money used, and what is the strength of state to push the different provinces forward? implementing new ways of treating and something. So what are the, I heard the question is, how do we measure relative how you measure performance? And how you make them and how do you And how you push them. Well, the, the, okay, so 
if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, we, we, we work from that premise. Uh, we have common indicators um, in term, and they're, they're developed by the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Um, those, uh, that's our sort of national repository of, of health indicators. Uh, we measure, uh, uh, we have standard measures, for example, in terms of primary health care. So what percentage of patients are seen in the first day or second day after um, needing a, uh, to meet with a primary care physician or a primary care provider? That would be one indicator. Uh, wait times. Uh, um, we measure the number of hours people have to wait to get admitted into, district, into, emer into emergency department. We took from the UK the four hours and then we tried to, to better that. And it's down as low as 1.2 hours in some of the best hospitals in Canada. So those are examples of the kind of indicators that we use. We also use health status indicators. So I'll give you the one that bothers me the most, and that's our infant mortality and child mortality. Canada used to lead the world. I think we were in the sixth spot when we had 6.8 deaths per thousand live births in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Good news is we're down to 5.3 deaths per thousand live births, so more, more kids are living through that first year of life. Bad news is in your country, I believe it's about 1.9 deaths per thousand live births. So what is it that your country's doing, or Japan, who's here from Japan? Japan has one of the lowest uh, infant mortality rates in the industrialized world as well. What are they doing in terms of uh, sudden infant death syndrome rates that are half hours that we're not doing? And coming back to the Aboriginal Canadians issue, we have Aboriginal Canadians with 15 deaths per thousand live births. In other words, it's three times what Canada is and ten times what Finland is. What, so we have some serious challenges there uh, by another indicator of relative health status. By the way, we, we started at 6th in the world, we're now to 34th in the world by OECD. So we, we, we really do have something to learn from Finland and other countries. The challenge of scaling up and spreading best practices in Canada is difficult, given our constitution. We, can't, we haven't got a federal government that can say to BC or to Ontario, you need to do this. Basically, we have to use sort of tugboat diplomacy, right, coupled with a, a little bit of greasing the skids in terms of grants. I'll give you this money. We so for example, IT, information technology. We have an organization called Canada Health InfoAid that spent $2.1 billion over about the last eight years to try and encourage physicians to adopt, uh, uh, digit, uh, digitize their data and, and, uh, and, and use it. Well, we're about 56% right now, physicians using uh, electronic medical records. I believe in your country, places like Denmark, it's 95, 97%. So we've got a long ways to go. And the only role that the federal government can play is, as I say, this moral encouragement coupled with grant made, uh, if you do this, then we'll give you the money. Uh, so what's, what's happening in Canada is that there's more and more leadership being uh, demonstrated by the premiers of each of the province and the provincial health ministers. So uh, one example of that is, I mentioned earlier on, we pay more for brand name drugs and generic drugs than pretty much any other uh, country on the planet, probably for the exception again of the United States. What provinces have done together is, is band together in group purchasing. To go to the pharmaceutical companies and say, listen, uh, we're going we're gonna to group purchase uh, common, uh, common drugs in hospitals. And, and certainly we've been very supportive of that. So uh, is that actually a question? Indicators and how we're trying our best to, to scale up and spread innovations in our country? So no common laws. Well, yeah. Uh, would you need some kind of status of laws? Correct. Correct. I believe in your country you've had a constitutional change. I was speaking with Eric, is it? Uh, uh, and he was telling me that uh, in Finland, it was also very decentralized with the municipalities and the councils. And that they, uh, you know, with Helsinki and everybody else, right? So, well, we kind of have some of those same problems in Canada. And so, BC is a good example of where they consolidate purchasing and, and, and shared services for all the stuff. Well, first off, for things that are province wide, like mental health, right? Uh, cancer therapy. Pardon me? Yeah, all the biggies where uh, economists 
I'll, I'll tell you that there's fairly strong evidence that suggests you need a catchment area of a million people or more to efficiently offer tertiary quaternary level care services. We have a province with 157,000 people. Prince Edward Island, wonderful little Prince Edward Island, but it tries to provide full line service, right? How many is there? Anybody a cardiac surgeon in the room by chance? You need to do at least 200 open hearts to keep your skill level up. That's why you need a population base of a million or more, or you're not going to be able to keep your skill level up. It's a quality issue as well as a cost efficiency issue. So. Uh, you know, we need we need somebody to come in and kind of shake things up a little bit. And who knows? Maybe after October 19th, we'll have a, a new prime minister in our country that might care about health and health care. I didn't say that, by the way, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I say that we have had for 20 years information guidance, and we thought in Finland that why we are so clever and smart, and so every county is doing its best when they are given the information how well it can be done. Mm -hmm. but it's not enough in this uh, in this budget system yeah. and in this in this system lack of money and it's not enough. Information is not going. It's 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 told but it's not heard. Yeah, just producing it if you have no receptor capacity. So creating you know big data. How many of you hear about big data? Without big data analytics. It's just big data. And what we found in our health and healthcare system, as there's been fiscal pressures on it, we've hollowed out our analytical capacity in our hospitals, in our provincial governments, uh, in our federal government. We've hollowed out the analytical capacity, the health policy capacity, to make sense of the data. And we did it for a really good, we've done it for a really good reason, and that is to redirect more resources where? To the front lines of the healthcare system. Um, but now we're finding ourselves, we've got some data, and we now have a shortage of people that actually can make sense out of that data. Uh, we call them the bridge people, the people that <laughs> lie at that intersection of the research community and the administrators in the system. We're in short supply of those people who can actually make sense of the data and communicate it in a way that's effective to the medical profession and others. Other comments, questions, before we move on to our biggest province, Ontario? So Ontario, smack dab in the middle of Canada, our biggest province, population of 13.6 million. Uh, it's it's kind of a uh, we chose it for two reasons to 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 showcase here today. One is it's the as I said earlier on it's the only province that still has hospitals. So this is the international hospital federation. So we thought that would make some sense. The second is that it's kind of a, a bit of a proxy for the rest of Canada because it has. High density areas like Toronto, our uh, uh, population of what uh, five million people, but that northern northwestern part is very rural, very remote, and so it, it's a it's a it's a province with all the kind of constituent parts of our country. Um, uh, recent events in the province of Ontario that are pretty, uh, perhaps uh, worthy of some note. Um, we had the passage of the Excellent Care for All Act uh, recently, and that was tied to uh, a change in the funding model and pay for performance, where we used to have glo uh, global budgeting. That's now gradually giving way to pay for performance. Uh, with up to 20 or 30 percent of a hospital's uh, budget um, uh, being at risk, quote unquote, to agreed upon HBAM, health-based allocation method uh, formula, um, as I said, we still have hospital boards. I sit on one, um, uh, and um, we have governance. Uh, we have overall responsibility, fiduciary, strategic um, responsibility for the, the hospital that I sit on. Um, in, importantly, if you run a deficit, it's like Donald Trump. You're fired, right? Uh, so you can't run deficits. They have fired boards and brought in trustees, uh, uh, and so uh, one of the interesting facts um, is, I mentioned the role of the federal government. So the federal government transfers to the provinces money, $34 billion. That is increasing at a rate of 6% per annum. 6% per annum. Healthcare costs are increasing about 2% per annum overall. 
The hospital budget at the Royal Ottawa, I'm chair of the Finance and Audit Committee, so I know this firsthand. Over the last four years, the federal government's transfers have increased by 6% per year. The budget, the global budget for the Royal Ottawa Hospital, zero, 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 and zero. With a rough, roughly 5% or more increase in our case load. So, you can only squeeze out so many efficiencies. And then there comes a time when you have to say, listen, we need to change the rules of this road. And so we're coming to that point in Ontario uh, as the 6% growth rate isn't passed from the federal government, isn't being passed on to the, to the hospital side. I don't know what it's like in British Columbia, but I suspect the 6% is also used for other purposes in, in British Columbia, being repurposed, right? Um, You've already heard about LIMS, Local Health Integrated Networks. They have 14 of them in the province of Ontario. Um, again, they have a lot of accountability, but not the authority to go with that accountability. We still have the bypass. What's the bypass? I'm not talking about coronary bypass. I'm talking about LIN bypass, where if you don't get the answer you want for the Local Health Integrated Network, you rap on the door to the minister or the deputy minister, and the Unfortunately, the minister or the deputy minister doesn't say, go back to the local health and integrated network. They have my confidence. They tend to open that door and tend to give in. So, a breakdown in the fundamental governance in the system in terms of authority and accountabilities. We have uh, um, health over here, and we have social services over there. I began my career with the Department of Health and Welfare, Canada, when we still felt that welfare and health dovetailed. We blew up the two departments and separated the two departments in Ontario, not unlike many other problems, including British Columbia, they separate the social and the health. And so we have CCACs, Community Care Access Centers, again, 14 of them, that run in separate stovepipes from, from the local health integrated networks. Again, not the way to promote the kind of handoffs that we just heard from the president of, of Kaiser Permanente. The home care programs need to be lined up uh, with the discharge programs. And it's interesting because you're seeing, and I've seen, the art of the workaround. People working in the system, they've actually found ways to get around that. So I visited one hospital, the, uh, the St. Joe's Hospital in central Toronto, where here was a CCAC um, person, staffer, right in the ER, working with the ER team to make sure that those that were not in need immediately of emergency services weren't just kicked back home, but actually had support services to go back home with, uh, with some, uh, some support. Uh, health Links, what's that? That's an emerging program. We can come back to any of these if you want to hear more about. But as we heard, uh, I guess, in two ways, uh, we've got a concentration of those that are users of high users of the system. One is end of life. We just heard that with the spike in the last sort of 30 days. The other are frequent users of the system. Health Links is designed to really get in there and look at what can we do to prevent repeat visits to the ER. How can we hook up those folks that don't have a family doc or a primary care physician or uh, aren't members of a family health team? How can we make sure that they avoid going to the ER and go where, where they should be going in the system? And so Health Links is a, is a data system, it's a fully integrated data system that zeroes in on those high, high users of the healthcare system. Um, and finally, I wanted to talk very briefly about ARCTIC. ARCTIC is a program that is an acronym standing for uh, Advancing or Adopting Research into Care. So it's one example of trying to do what I just said we needed to do, which is to shine a light on exemplary practices, scale them up, and speed up the process of embedding those changes in the health and healthcare system. The other way to think of this is I, I call it fighting the Canadian condition. What's the Canadian condition? That we have to reinvent, reinvent uh, ways of doing things better for each jurisdiction and sometimes even for regions within a jurisdiction. Someone recently said Canada has more pilot projects in healthcare than Air Canada has pilots. We've got to stop that. And so Arctic is one way to do that. It's, a, it's all about KT, 
knowledge translation, knowledge transformation, transferring what we know into practice, moving along more quickly. It aims to accelerate and support the implementation of evidence in a drive for quality. It's, as I listen to Kaiser Permanente again, this is kind of a mini effort to try and mimic, mimic Kaiser Permanente in six or seven key areas. And we do that through executive leadership support training programs. Um, we do that by taking uh, Jim Collins, or, or rather uh, Cotter's advice about creating guiding teams, starting with physicians and physician engagement. And what we've learned just in, in the short three years or four years of this program is we've been able to reduce down to less than two years the transition time that would otherwise have taken 15 or 17 years in terms of changing clinical practice. Um, it's, un, it's, it's, it's being funded essentially by the Government of Ontario through the Council, as I said, the Academic Healthcare Organization of Ontario, established in 2010. The money only started to flow uh, four years ago. There are six or seven uh, projects that, that are being funded. I just wanted to highlight some of them for you. The one that we're actively working on, how many in this room are worried about superbugs? CFR, uh, CZFACIL, MSRA, MERS. But superbugs, as you know, are winning, right? And there's no new research being undertaken to create that new uh, sort of family of uh, anti, anti uh, uh, microbials. So um, what we've done in, in Canada is shine, shine a light on an antimicrobial stewardship program that exists in one of our hospitals. It's now expanded throughout Ontario. And uh, the Federal Minister of Health has just asked us whether she could use the description of this program to put it on the G7 Health Minister's meeting. So there's one example where we're doing something really, really well. We need to stop reinventing the wheel and having antimicrobial stewardship programs reinvented across Canada. Uh, and, and the Arctic program has been essential to trying to do that in Ontario. The other areas are in the area of uh, alcoholism, depression. Uh, there's a a program called MOVE ON, that's an acronym standing for Mobilizing of the Vulnerable Elderly in Ontario uh, to try and again ensure that uh, um, they only get hospitalized when they need to be hospitalized and only as long as necessary. Uh, funded through quality, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Health Quality of Ontario. Um, again, don't, won't have time to get into this, but build an implementation machine. What do we mean by that? The data support, uh, the, uh, the convener function, uh, the uh, distribution of the analysis of the information, uh, arm's length, putting it through a central resource, that's the Canadian, or the Council for Academic Hospitals of Ontario, and fuel it with expertise. Bring it in, bring in all the players. It's almost a, a, net, a center of excellence. If you don't have all the experts in the room, then you failed, and you won't get funding. Again, we can, uh, this is all, uh, we have some flash sticks here, by the way. You can take them away with, uh, with, the, uh, with the slides on there. Um, again, in the interest of time, um, we've had these six projects over the last four years, 79 sites in, in Ontario, um, 245 now changed champions who are, are assigned and affiliated with uh, the Arctic program servicing over 18,000 patients, and, uh, and every indication is that we're succeeding in speeding up that, that rate of adoption and closing that no new gap that I referred to earlier on. I'm going to stop there. Any questions or additions from Ontario, or a colleague from Ontario, that you want to add anything on health links, or uh, uh, I, I didn't mention, I maybe should have, that we're on the cusp of a major announcement, I'm told, in, uh, in terms of integrated primary care. When people start to look at how Canada has fallen behind, the number one identified shortfall is we don't have uh, uh, sufficiently well integrated primary care system. Want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think one of the biggest challenges to implement um, improved quality within the Ontario healthcare landscape is is the lack of, of technological infrastructure as well. I think you, you spoke about that a little bit. It is that um, you know even most hospitals are at you know him stage two or below levels in Ontario, 
it makes it very, very hard to build in the information science and decision support that's needed to try to reduce variability in standardized care and, and uh, I mean, e even, even leveraging or scaling up uh, effective um, clinical projects when shown to make a difference. It's much harder if you don't have the technological infrastructure that delivers the information and helps guide clinicians at the point of care. Because mm -hmm. it really ends up being uh, an educational initiative or, res or major restructuring initiatives you know, involving um, you know, leadership and management. It, it, becomes, it becomes much more complicated. So I mean, that's something I, I hope that you know, the Ontario government will take more leadership in the future. Mm -hmm. Because to, to develop a 21st information age model of care, you can't do that with, without the right technological infrastructure. And I'm just talking about hospitals, mm -hmm. never mind, you know, family physicians or community-based health supports or social service agencies that are all in the healthcare business as well. Any questions or comments? Yes. Back there, please. Uh, my name is Colin. I come from Latvia. It's a very tiny country compared to Canada, of course. Uh, I have a, a question concerning how you allocate the money in, in a healthcare field. Uh, it means that there are different uh, methods like the fee for services, uh, let's say, computation system, and especially for the hospitals, the DRG system, where you get paid for, for some activity or to provide. What do you think about DRG system? Because it's become quite popular in, in, in Europe. What is the coming? So, in Canada, um again, come back to basic allocation. So about 32% uh, of the total healthcare spending in Canada goes to hospitals. About 17% goes to the physicians, and about 17% goes to pharmaceuticals. So that gives you kind of the overall allocation, right? In terms of hospitals, we moved in the 1970s uh, from uh, basically uh, per patient funding fully to global, uh, global uh, base budgeting. And in the last five, to or 10 years have moved gradually towards more, uh, as I said, pay for performance kinds of systems where it's not DRG systems uh, per se, but it is, uh, they are, the adjustments for hospitals are based on, on acuity adjustments. So you take into account the age and the acuity of the patients, and that's built into the funding formula, that HBAM formula here in Ontario and in other allocations in other provinces. Um, but it's not a formal, it's not as formal as, you know, sort of a DRG based system where uh, you bill after the fact based on the DRG system. We still get money, we like to think upfront uh, in advance of the fiscal year, but I can tell you, we just got notice of our budget for 2016, 15-16, uh, about three weeks ago in Ontario. So you can you imagine running a hospital where you don't know what your budget's going to be until a, the beginning or the end of the second quarter of your fiscal year. Really, really hard. One of our hospitals in Ontario, in, in Ottawa, the Briere Hospital, got a big surprise under this HBAM formula. $1.6 million less than they were anticipating. And they had met or exceeded all of the targets. All of them. And they, he, he went back to the people in the Ministry of Health and said, I met all your targets, and you still gave me $1.6 million. And he says, well, they, they say, that's too bad because it's a zero-sum game. And because other hospitals further exceeded their targets than you did, you actually want to get less. Now this is a hospital that takes all of the sickies, all, all of those patients that need high-level care in that last 30 to 60 to 90 days of life. He's got no options. There's no place to pass them on to. So uh, we need to work on our allocation system. I wouldn't recommend it or commend it to Latvia. <laughs> Other questions or comments? All right. Okay, so the segue to the next, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Dale to, to, to pick up where I've left off here. One of the, the, one of the things that we've concluded in Canada that it, is that unless we have better leadership, develop better leaders, and, and attend to better governance systems, we're going to continue to fight spot fires in the health and healthcare system. We need to step above all of that and try to invest in current leaders, support them where we can, and to develop future leaders. And so Dale's going to share with you some, some of the things we're doing in that regard. Dale? Dale. Thank you.
Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a, um, a little bit about a, a modest division that we have running here within Healthcare Can called CHA Learning. So as Bill described, that's a carryover from the beginnings of what Healthcare Can and, and our origins from, um, well, back in 1951, and the Canadian Healthcare Association, which was then called the Canadian Hospital Association, um, developed its first um, program, um, which was a health information management program, but at that time was called the Medical Archivist Program. Um, and it was a, a, a program that was developed or delivered largely in, in the uh, style of learning that you would um, associate with correspondence. So it was a, a one-year program. Um, they would spend maybe a few hundred hours and then they'd have a two-week sort of residential program. Um, over the last, uh, well, it will be 65 years next year, um, the CHA Learning Program has continued to develop and grow um, and has we've moved it into a fully online program. Um, so, uh, formerly a curriculum for our health information management program that would have been a few hundred hours, now takes students more than two years and about 35 hours a week to complete and this program now boasts more than 200 registrants. Uh, we are unique in Canada as a wholly online education provider delivering education to the whole country, and internationally even, um, but what, we, what separates us out, I mean, there's lots of online learning programs, there's lots of programs in healthcare, um, there's lots of leadership programs, um, there's programs in every province, um, there's all these different organizations that are delivering um, education, uh, but uniquely that we're doing all those things together, and we are, at the heart of that, we are by healthcare for healthcare. So the, the education programs we develop are developed by the healthcare workers, professionals, experts within the system and delivered back out to them, to their peers and to those mentors or mentees that they would be supporting. Um, that means that we deliver it, uh, our courses from coast to coast to coast to the 13 provinces and territories and that our courses are built um, to support the leadership development of today's um, healthcare system. So the vision was to transform this program into this health information management program to the flagship program that it, it has become. And it highlights the vision of CHL Learning as we conducted a zero-based relevancy review over the last few years, retiring any of our programs that didn't fit, renewing, transforming those that still fit, but needed a new sort of chassis sort of underneath them, and then investing in new programs and courses that were quite frankly missing from our strategy. So you might not, not look at CHA Learning, and, and, our, and it, it is, you know, admittedly a very modest program considering, you know, large institutions around the world or in Canada. But if you look at that, um, we are, um, you wouldn't sort of see sort of the modern, the new, new Tesla Model X sort of, sort of sitting there. But our goal was to be relevant in 20, 2015 um, and deliver quality products that meet the, the needs of our members. This doesn't mean a lot of bells and whistles um, in and of itself as a delivery system, not that different than the healthcare system itself. Um, the, it was about affordability and accessibility, um, being as timely as we can uh, with our releases. And through this strategy, we wanted to sustain CHA learning and provide a sustained, even growing stream of graduates uh, to Canada's healthcare organization. So today, CHA learning delivers. Sorry. Thank you. So today, CHN Learning delivers our health information management program along with 15 other programs and numerous courses that have a student population of 600 active students at any one time. Uh, this is up almost 50% over the past five or three years, and our programs are growing at a rate of about three or more per year. And this is largely a result of a change in our instructional model as we move students to an online platform using Moodle and fully retired our face-to-face -face intramural sessions. It's also a result of our partnership with other leading organizations like CCHL um, and our members. Uh, because once we moved our programs online, we could change the way we ran our business, how we marketed ourselves, and how we ran our operations, and how we developed our courses. I'm just gonna... So, in short, the, the strategy is to develop an innovative model for program delivery and roll it out first with our health information management program. So 
in and of itself, we represent a, a microcosm of, of innovation and spread um, within our own organization or our division. Uh, to start with that health information management program and then spread that innovation through other CHA learning programs. So online, we're able to disassemble many of our programs and move away from a fixed date cohort model, which you see in most academic organizations, and adopt a continuous intake model. This means that students can begin programs that are still hundreds of hours in length anytime and learn anywhere, which is you know, very relevant in a country the size of Canada. Um, and so that's, um, sorry, and, so, yeah, and then take away the, uh, the travel. I don't know if this is consistent across um, many of your health organizations and countries, but in Canada with dwindling resources, um, our regional health authorities and hospitals have cut back in terms of travel. So we have quote unquote, you know, the whole province is travel bans, um, which makes access to education, certainly national education, where you want to learn from others and learn in different places, increasingly difficult. So the move to online education is increasingly becoming a relevant and viable, if necessary, way of doing education. It also allows to modularize our content and get, get away from a strict sort of tableau d'hote uh, learning model of all or nothing and move to a more a la carte model. So most students continue to purchase sort of the tableau d'hote option because it leads to recognizable learning certificates and credentials but it has still allowed students to pick and choose the co and construct their own learning plans and goals. It also meant that we can align our programs to interconnect with each other and base them off a common foundation of management, quality, and leadership. So, so if you as I've sort of tried to explain as best as I can in this diagrammatic, which is gonna get confusing, um, certainly out of focus it'll even be more confusing, but um, uh, so, we have a set a course called Management Essentials, which sort of establishes um, a framework of management competencies underneath all of our programs. And then within that program, we layer into it a, a set of leadership competencies um, that uh, Ray and uh, the Canadian College for Health Leaders will describe that in a lot more detail, um, which sort of sits as a foundation. So in the context of that, we have our management programs um, developing competencies and then throughout that, we established a set, a set of leadership competencies. Um, so, the, our management essentials programs, which we'll come back to it again in a moment, is predicated on the belief that management at any level is not synonymous with leadership. And we've talked a lot about leadership in the context of this conference. We talked about management, but I think we need to make sure and, and I think recognize that they are two uh, clearly different functions. Management remains an essential function in all organizations, including healthcare. Our goal, however, was not to teach our future managers to simply monitor and control the status quo, but rather to inspire them themselves to change, to become change agents and become the future state of healthcare in Canada. For this reason, we integrated our Management Essentials program with the LEADS framework that Ray is going to talk about, a frame which, framework which together with our Management Essentials program comprises the sort of the two hands clapping quote unquote from Bill. So, um, so, so necessary to strong organizations. We're challenging our students and managers to not just do, not just doing things right, but to be doing the right things right. Uh, bottom line, we're asking our management students to be leaders, to engage others, to achieve results, to develop coalitions, and to transform the system. As such, the LEADS framework, which Ray will speak about, in detail in a moment is woven through all our programs from our health information management program all the way up to our governance uh, development program. So if that sort of makes sense in the context of that, our programs then, and I just sort of will go through these very quickly, we have our integrated quality management program which supports uh, patient engagement and experience program which is under development, um, a change leadership program which we're building, um, a Canadian Patient Safety Officer Program, uh, built, uh, building um, safety officers, obviously. Um, um, biomedical courses uh, as a foundation for our Health Information Management Program, which will lead into a new program on supporting indicators use. Um, then we have a sort of a long-term care sort of function within our, our division. Um, other plans for other streams of, of learning sort of to be developed. Um, 
We have um, a research course or set of courses that, are, that have been recently developed in cooperation with um, one of our member partners. Um, and then we have a food and nutrition program that develops uh, the managers who manage that, that function within hospitals. And then overlaying all that, throughout all of that is, are the management essentials, programs or competencies that sort of underlie all that um, and the leads capabilities that, um, that uh, thread their way through that as well. And then sitting over top of that is the governance development program that we offer. So just, what would I? Okay. Um, I think we have on four graph time. Okay. So I'll just talk to you um, a little bit more about um, our governance uh, program that we offer. Um, so if management and leadership are the two hands clapping, then when you speak about effective governance, you introduce another hand and sort of the metaphors sort of fall apart then. So, um, so metaphors um, aside, governance and the lack of effective governance in our Canadian healthcare system has been cited by some as the elephant in the room. For this reason, we have invested over the past three years in developing a new education stream focusing on developing our health governors. There remains much work to be done and it remains difficult work to do because healthcare governors in Canada are far from the first to identify their needs in professional development and in many ways our ultimate demonstration of the training gap we often see in executive levels where people with strong technical skills or knowledge are promoted to positions of authority without providing them with the further skills or knowledge to succeed in their roles. It's also complicated in Canada because our governors are by and large unpaid volunteers. We recognize that to govern is not the same as to manage or to lead, but that the governors are nevertheless still leaders. And there is at the heart of our governance development program, uh, which includes two courses and a third nearing completion. So we, while we have developed the Health Governors Foundation Series, a 15-hour program which is designed to provide health system board members an opportunity to gain invaluable insights as to their role and the modes of governance, fiduciary, strategic, and generative, we are further complemented this with another course on governing for quality and patient safety, a unique role for trustees in healthcare. And we have heard much about at this conference and outside the conference about the culture eating strategy. And we determined that at the heart of so much of what we are aspiring to create and change in the boardroom hinges on the convergence of culture and leadership. For this reason, we are nearing completion of a new course whose purpose is to develop the generative governance in, health, in, in the health sector itself. And to do so, it will build on the notions of governance established in our foundation's program and add to these the notions of generative governance, generative culture, generative care, and generative trust. Strong, and strongly throughout this is the role of leadership at all levels. As an aside, I think it's interesting that as we undertook the work on generativity in, in the <coughs> In, in the boardroom, um, as well as other work that we were doing around the, um, the role of leadership in governance, we concluded that these words are largely synonymous, um, and that what we would, whatever we call them, they're critical to developing caring and trusting uh, board capable of leading organizations to better outcomes. So it just is that we ask our, our boards to be generative, to think outside the box, and that that in itself is, is what we, in other contexts, we would describe as leadership. So, with that, yeah, if there's any specific questions, for sure. Okay, <clears throat> best for that. Well, good morning, everyone. I feel like everybody should have a big stretch break, you know. I, but, uh, you know, I want to talk uh, about, I think, uh, the challenge that we really, I think, we face globally. And, and that's why we've been a partner in, in uh, you know, trying to develop some just management competencies that could be used globally. Many countries don't even have a starting point, so we want to contribute to that. Uh, I'm not going to really talk too much about the college, just because I want to get to a more focused area. But we were formed in 1970, ready to be a, a college for hospital administrators. And over time, we have completely evolved into representing all sectors, all levels of leaders, all across the country, about 3,300 members, 
We also have 80 corporate members, which is also very important because we can get into exchanges with the private sector on knowledge exchange. Many of those, kind of, you know, industry, you know, many of them are global companies working in hundreds of systems. Uh, our experience tends to be in the system that we're in. So we can, we can get an awful lot from that exchange and it's a very powerful uh, asset for us as a college to have them as members. Our vision, I think, is really important for what I want to talk about, and that is the idea of how do we advance leadership in many, and that, that, that term has many layers to it. One is respect for the role of leadership as being a, an important asset, uh, often not, not uh, you know, recognized for its true value. Uh, also, how do we advance um, you know, the concept of um, using le uh, leadership as a lever for improvement? Uh, and how do we prepare, uh, you know, how do we advance uh, the professionalism of leadership in terms of what it takes to do that work, which is also another level of it. How do we attract new people into leadership and how do we make that a desired profession for people who might be clinical, uh, that may want to advance into, into something quite different than maybe they thought they'd be doing when they started their career. We believe uh, that if we could, if we could build uh, excellent leadership, not just at the individual, but also at the collective. We could take on those challenges that we face. You know, I, 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 that, that uh, presentation this morning, you know, wasn't that leadership in action? You know, a vision set 70 years ago, continually evolving over all those you know, generations of new people moving it forward into something which is probably not, it's not even there yet, but they have a sense of where they're going. That to me is leadership in action. How do we build that energy to do that? And that's what I want to talk about. And this, uh, this idea of, um, you know, do we have a modern view of leadership to me is very important. And, and, and you know, I, I think that, um, you know, many of our structures uh, are really focused on, uh, you know, what we thought leadership was in, in the 60s and so on, which was a top-down uh, method of actually execution. And that worked fine until we became very complex. And when, and when we're very complex, uh, the challenge is that uh, the senior levels don't know the answers anymore. Uh, and in fact, I think that's one of our biggest challenges is, you know, we need to build solutions uh, that we can't even imagine right now. And that's why I like this morning's presentation. This building that solution uh, was a tremendous vision, you know, to, just to get a sense of, get, wrap your arms around it. That is a challenge that we face. So if we take the, if we take the view that um, leadership should, is not really top down anymore, uh, even though we're still practicing generally in, in that way, it tells us that we have a lot of work to do, and, and you know, I really like the, the comment from, uh, uh, two comments really, from the keynote yesterday from Rain, the idea of and, and being an empowering term. I really like that because I think it, it really gets into this whole idea of leadership needing to become distributed. Uh, and also I, I think that uh, uh, Bernard uh, this morning, uh, in what he talked about, he talked about this four generational uh, you know, situation that we face. My daughter is 21 years old, and I can tell you that her whole life, she's, she's really thought about, you know, her ability to, to change things, and, and you know, and, and uh, you know, all these, that whole generation of, uh, you know, just wanting to get in there and do things, they want voice, they want to, you know, they, they want to be part of something, uh, they're not going to accept going into a, a structure where, where they don't have a, a role. You know, they would not be inspired or energized by that. And in fact, they would seek out organizations where they, they do have a voice and they do have a role. So this whole idea of how do we work in a, in a more distributed way of leadership, when we've done study tours into Sweden, and they view the, you know, the, the role of a frontline worker, and they talk about this all the time when, when they're talking about how they, they, they think. But you know, the first role is to do, the jo do your job well, and, and your second role is to improve what you do. That is leadership. You know, so the whole idea too of looking at leadership where it's not confined just to formal leader roles, although those are really important, the fact that anybody could lead regardless of whether they're a formal leader or not, that really expands our view of what leadership is and it also really expands our idea of capacity in order to actually get the work done that needs to be done in order for us to, to move forward. So I think that whole view of leadership becoming, uh, being viewed as distributed is a very powerful view of, of where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that as well without giving up your accountability, and we talked about that earlier, but you know, we still need that accountability. But if we, if we go by the, the feeling that only formal leaders can lead and nobody else can, we cut out a lot of people with a lot of knowledge. And I, I think in particular the knowledge of the front line, the front line where 
you know, actually, everything that counts happens at the front line in, in terms of performance. Quality, safety, you know, relationships, knowledge exchange, that whole front line is so important. But I can tell you that the front line often feels divorced from the action in terms of decision making or voice. And that's a very, that's a, a big challenge for us. How do we bring the divide of, of formal leadership uh, into the front line so that we, we can build the connections between it and make it cohesive? It's a very important challenge for us. Another challenge is investment in leadership. And you know, one of, the one of the things that upsets us, I think, from the leadership side, when we hear you know, funding cuts and so on, it's often, uh, you know, we're gonna cut leadership because we want to invest in the front line. Uh, to me, it's a really insensitive statement and also a, a statement that doesn't recognize the reality that to get things done, we need to have leadership in place uh, uh, to actually move things forward. So we also have to uh, fight that bias where leadership is discretionary somehow. And as this investment in leadership, which often gets sacrificed as well in, in the face of spending cuts, but uh, you know, industry would take the opposite view where they invest in uh, leadership development because they know that their whole business is driven by the talent of their organization. And, and I think in health, we, we need to realize that too. So this whole idea of how do we build quantity of leadership, more capacity, more alignment, more cohesion, more engagement, to me is a very important part of success, likely globally. You know, I don't think it's just a Canadian issue, but in Canada, we're certainly talking about this as something very important. And then the second part is the quality of, of leadership, and uh, and that, that quality side is very important too because we need to be future oriented. And and you know, I, I like Sweden as another example. Uh, when we visit Stockholm, uh, their view is up to 2040. You know, and, and uh, uh, which is a big view. I could tell you for Canada, our view is probably the next election cycle, uh, and, and we're just having one in a, in a couple of weeks. And and. Uh, you know, and for us, that's one of our biggest challenges is that when we look at changing our system, we have a lot of work to do. We do a lot of things well, but we do have areas that we need to improve in. We need to look farther out because some of the changes that we're going to need to make are, are going to be you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the making. Uh, we need to be out much farther in our view in order to get a sense of what changes we need to make. Also, we need to focus on less things. You know, it's very hard to do 100 things. I don't know how you feel, but I can't do a hundred things. And in fact, I think the evidence would show that most people can only manage more than five, you know, no more than five uh, to get things done. So that whole idea of becoming much more focused on what we're working on, certainly focusing on improvement as the major, you know, the major thing that, that we're, 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 uh, we're looking at. But also looking at leadership as really one of its most important roles to, to, to drive the strategic directions. So connecting leadership to achievement of the strategy uh, it's also a very important part for organizations to recognize that that is what leadership is there for. Let's use it to move that forward. So this whole idea of, a, 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 I would say, a more, a more modern view of leadership, we would say, is really articulated in, in this concept. In Canada, we've been fortunate to have a very interesting um, uh, thing evolve uh, that actually started in BC. And this was the idea of, uh, so BC uh, was, I think in the early 2000s, we started talking about the fact that nobody was talking about the demographic uh, impact of leadership in terms of, you know, the boomers and, and, and people leaving. We were talking about physicians and nurses and, you know, we're going to have enough people and so on. Nobody was talking about leadership. So we started talking about it as associations and so on in the early 2000s to say that we have to talk about leadership too. And, and in fact, I think if most of you looked at your, your, your countries and your systems, you know, we have some organizations within five years are going to lose 50% of their staff, okay? And I, I don't know what, you know, what, what you've seen when you look in your lens, but that's a pretty shocking number. And, uh, and the challenge that we're going to face with, with this uh, demographic shift as well is that it's not going to be a planned exit, right? Has anybody told you I'm leaving in five years, right? Uh, and the challenge is that it's going to happen uh, unplanned, across all sectors and, and all systems globally. Uh, and certainly in Canada, it, it's a big issue for us to worry about. So BC started talking about this. They invested money to talk about what's a modern view of leadership. Like how should we view leadership and how should we prepare uh, our, our, our capacity in order to do what's going to be required as we move into this demographic shift. And this is where uh, the idea of a new framework started evolving. 
Secondly, we also have to look at how leadership is perceived. And this is a, a tool which is very interesting. This is our accreditation body, Accreditation Canada. They survey the perception of staff relative to different levels of leadership. So this is a view of staff, say in a, in a hospital that was surveyed. This is an average across all the organizations that were surveyed. Getting the perception of the staff view of senior management. And I can tell you that if you surveyed senior management, they would say, what are, what, what's, you know, what are we focusing on? Patient safety, uh, you know, staff wellness. All, you know, these are all sitting on everybody's agenda as, as the things to move forward. But if you look at the perception of staff relative to senior management, how much of, are, you know, what's, what's the feeling of senior management in terms of their commitment to a uh, safe and healthy workplace? 73%. Same for high quality care. And I would, I would suspect that most of the big things being pushed in, in in the system by senior management is whole area of patient safety and quality, that's 73%. But even understanding organizational goals, you know, 64%, or senior, senior managers acting on feedback, just over 50%. These are not good scores for senior management in the eyes of staff. So it gets us again to, you know, how do we work in a modern view of leadership? Uh, because these are areas that, uh, and senior management looking at that would be very disappointed because it doesn't reflect their effort. But that's the perception. So, so we had a very interesting, uh, I, you know, developing a new framework. Actually, started in BC around uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, there was research uh, that was uh, funded actually by the, the BC government to develop a new view, view of leadership. It was uh, the work was actually done through Royal Roads University, as the university that uh, showed, that uh, recorded the research team. Dr. Graham Dixon, who is actually I think visited in some other countries. He was head of the research team that actually uh, developed this framework. Uh, this framework um, really started <laughs> looking at the world. So this was uh, looking at the world and also looking at thought leaders who were publishing within uh, the leadership space to get ideas. And, and, and out of this came the, the articulation of a framework, went through some validation in, in Canada through a, a probably over a two year period. And then it started emerging around 2007 or so uh, as a framework, which went, and, it, and we went through some additional work on it. But this is really the framework, it's called the LEADS framework. We also call it LEADS in a Caring Environment framework. And it's really built around uh, five views uh, of, of a leader and, and the behaviors of how leaders need to work. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, framework because, and, and, and of course it's LEADS, which is an acronym. We, we, we need uh, acronyms in healthcare, which are very important. Uh, but this one is nice because it actually helps us remember it. LEADS is the acronym. And each of those letters is a, is a domain, and each domain has four behaviors. What's interesting about this framework, which is different than other frameworks, is that it actually talks about lead self. And lead self is really uh, a view that most, you know, many frameworks don't take, but lead self is probably one of the most important domains for success as a leader because it's, it's about self-awareness. So what behavior is self-awareness? Are you aware of how you're perceived? Are you aware of your biases in terms of which could impact how you decide things? Uh, are, you, are you aware of, of, uh, of, of who you are in, in the people that you're working with? So that whole perception of self is really important. But it also talks about um, self-management. So how do you stay healthy in a tough job of leading, physically, mentally, emotionally? Uh, which is very important for, for success. But it also goes farther and it talks about how do you develop yourself. So, you know, we're in a high knowledge industry. Leadership can't escape uh, the knowledge exposure. So how do, how do leaders develop themselves so that they can continue to grow? Uh, and, and also, do they know what areas they're strong in, what areas that they're, they're weaker in, so that they know where to actually invest their learning? And then lastly, and probably one of the most important behaviors, is character. You know, are you trustworthy? Are you viewed as being honest? Are you open? Are you consistent? Do you have integrity? Uh, and ultimately, that's a big test because if you're not honest uh, and if you're not believable, who's going to listen to you? And and leaders who don't have people following them are not leaders. Uh, they're they're uh, you know they're isolated. Uh, engage others is really important because it gets into the whole world of how do we. Uh, interact with each other. So in this would be teamwork, uh, which is really important, but it would get even deeper into, you know, 
that that team actually having the right people on it, uh, that is, you know, we're not wasting time with that, we're, we're getting knowledge out of it, and we're actually moving things forward. But it also gets into the health of the work setting, uh, which is also very important, because uh, if we don't have healthy work settings, we don't have good knowledge exchange, we can't make decisions, we can't make improvements, it undermines what we're trying to achieve. But it also gets into the supporting the development of others. So in the first one, the, uh, under Lee itself, you're, you're worried about your own development. In this other one, we're worried about developing others and supporting others so that they too can succeed. And that's where you know supporting mentoring and coaching and investments uh, become a very important part of, of, um, of engage others. Uh, achieve results is directional. So it's setting a direction. Uh, this is a very important uh, domain because it also talks about the role of governance and the role of leadership. So what's governance role? Mission vision, values, and governance also sets the strategy, like what they believe the strategy is to advance those other things, mission, vision, values. And then they end up, so governance approves something and then they hand off to leadership to execute, to execute those directions, and that's the handoff between governance and, and the leadership. And then governance at that point uh, takes more of a, uh, a view of uh, how, is it, you know, how is it moving forward so measurement becomes really important. You know, what we, you have to measure in order to, to show that you're actually, uh, you know, you, you a starting point in the sense of where you're moving forward. Um, so measurement becomes very important because you, it indicates whether you're on track or not. But it goes a little farther than that. It says, well, you have to share results. So you know, if staff are involved in moving something forward, they're being communicated on in terms of what, what their efforts are, are showing. You know, are we making improvements? That needs to be fed back because that encourages the, the work that's being done, it validates it and it encourages other things to move forward. So achieve results becomes very important. Um, <coughs> develop coalitions is about working, I would say, generally externally. So who do you need to work with in order to advance what you're trying to do? Now in healthcare, uh, is there any country that does not have pol political aspects in their health system? You know, politics is a big part, but you have to be able to navigate the political landscape that you're in. That is part of developing coalitions, but developing coalitions is also saying, who do we need to involve on this effort because we need, the no we need more knowledge. We don't have enough knowledge to do this. Who do we need to bring in as a knowledge broker or, or a knowledge expert in order to help us with what we're trying to achieve? Or who do we need to bring in and what we're trying to move forward because we need them to champion this and not sabotage it later because they weren't involved in the effort. So that becomes, a, again, a very, very deliberate way in terms of how you try and move things forward. And then when you get into systems transformation, this is the whole change management side. And I can tell you in Canada, this is one domain that, that we do struggle with our execution of change and our ability to change our system. Uh, and that's, that's disappointing because I can tell you there's tremendous effort going forward to actually make that happen. So system transformation is very important. It also uh, takes the leader in a position where they champion the change and they, they defend it so that uh, you know, it, it gets supported uh, as it moves forward. Uh, system transformation though also uh, requires uh, a future view. So looking into the future, scanning, uh, and, and making sure that the things that you're trying to move forward are the right things uh, that, would, that would make a difference because it's hard to make change we have to get as much uh, stretch as we possibly can out of our changes uh, because we don't, uh, you know, they're not easy to, to, to achieve. So that really is the LEADS framework. What's interesting about this framework is that it started in BC and it's still being used extensively in BC. Um, but it's not just in BC. Because in 2009, uh, we made a decision from an association point of view and we had you know, we had really, uh, we have a network of about 40 network partners called Canadian Health Leadership Network, CH on that. Uh, the college and an association in BC, which was actually part of the effort in BC, we all made a decision that we would use the LEADS framework nationally. And we did our first webinar on this, February 2010. I remember because I was uh, co-hosting it with uh, Dr. Dixon. We made our first national webinar on LEADS, February 2010. And here we are now, five years later, and this framework is being used all across the country. It's being used in all sectors. Uh, it's being used in hospitals and regional health authorities. 
Many provinces have said we want to use Leeds as our framework. Uh, we now have it influencing the uh, uh, university curriculum. It's actually embedded uh, as a reference point in our, um, in our accreditation standards for both leadership and governance. Many organizations are using Leeds to actually get a sense of how to approach talent management and succession planning. Uh, some authorities are using it as a change management tool to actually pre-plan change before it gets executed. Uh, we have one health authority who's using it to change how their governance model works. And, and it's being used, uh, we don't even know all the people that are using it across the country because you can use Leeds uh, and, and, and just use Leeds to move forward. Uh, so this is something that is unprecedented. Uh, I, you know, I think if you could even think of a, a framework, I mean, in Canada, the, like uh, you know, ten years ago, that existed for more than one organization, you, you, you know, it would have been uh, amazing. We've never had anything move far like this across the country, and we think as we look forward uh, that this is going to be a, a sentinel change in how leadership works in our country. And other countries are also starting to wonder, you know, uh, should we be looking at Leeds, including Australia, which has uh, looked at Leeds. We're in discussions with Brazil. Uh, but there, there is something magical about this uh, that is really, in my entire career, is unprecedented. And I'm not even aware of it ever happening in any other country in the way that it's happened. And, and I can tell you, too, that we're, we're doing it by, it's leaders moving, uh, helping leaders. Uh, uh, this is being done by, by collaboration. Uh, and, and, uh, and as a college, our role really is to help support the use of leads uh, in organizations that really want to use it to, to not just change the, indi the uh, leaders individually, but change how the culture of leadership works in organizations and systems. And I think the other interesting thing about leads is that you've had a very short introduction to it. You probably have a bit of a feel for it in that short time period, so it's simple. Uh, it's simple, but it's complete. You know, you, you can't be, you can't just say, well, I just want to do two domains and I'll forget the other three, because actually all five are required uh, uh, and it's portable. Uh, one thing that uh, is quite powerful is that, you know, one of the, the groups that are most interested in leads when we do our work, uh, at the growing group, I would say, are physicians. Who, uh, I would, you know, in my career, and I was a hospital administrator before I joined uh, the college at, uh, in 2008, but. You know, I, I worked uh, very hard to, to work with physicians to, 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 you know, to show that, you know, how we could collaborate, but it wasn't an easy sell for everybody, you know, it, uh, it was like leadership and physicians were on, in separate camps and, and there wasn't a lot of accommodation for, for you know, how, how we could collaborate and you had to work hard to make it work, but, but I find the fact that they're interested in something like this and they can, they can pick up and understand it is a really important part of physicians understanding leadership and and moving into leadership and feeling comfortable that they can contribute to that because they have tremendous knowledge that we need to, to use. Also, I like the fact that it's, a, it's great at, at all levels too because the LEADS framework is actually sensitive to four levels of leaders. The, you know, the first time leader, the, the, the middle manager, the, the, the senior, and then the most senior executive. So four levels, so it's applicable to levels, but it's applicable to all sectors. So we have home care using it and they're using it in, in some of the structures talked about it's being used in government and all these other s sectors so and, and uh, it was based on evidence because it started off so we, we like evidence-based is an evidence-based framework but it does have a you know it's got a nice you know when I often speak to students on this and it really resonates with them very quickly that, that there's some there's something to this which it's cohesive and it's they get a sense of it and how it, how it hangs together so that's Leeds. Uh, we think that this is going to be a, a difference maker in Canada as we go forward. And, and it's going to help us with that tough agenda of how does leadership need to move in order for us to execute what we need to do. And, uh, and also we do have a national conference that Bill mentioned uh, and we offer it in June every year. It's going to be offered in Ottawa. And we're very much focused on this pathways to innovation and change and, and we want to start focusing on you know, the types of things that we can actually move forward and how do we move faster on them, uh, which is probably our most important challenge we face in our country. Uh, that's what we wanted to share, and uh, I think Bill will move to uh, questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, uh, our luncheon uh, awaits, but we have maybe two or three minutes. Uh, any, any comments or questions, any burning questions that you had of Canada? And Leadership and governance. 
If not, there's, uh, as I said before, there's some flash sticks here for anybody who wants to copy the presentation. You had, some of the slides were a little complicated, and you might be able to make uh, better uh, use of, this, of the uh, flash stick. And I, and I can't help it, but uh, Graham and I actually wrote a book on the LEADS framework. So if you're interested in knowing more about it, uh, Springer published it in uh, the spring of 2014. So uh, please feel free to try and track down the book. So thanks for your attention, and uh, thanks for your interest in Canada, and uh, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. There's the official thank you, right there. <laughs>